Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, June 12th, 2019. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about a large blob of metal found on the moon. It's been a year since, since uh, Opportunity died. Uh, had they found Snoopy? A double AAS statement on Starlink and large planets rare on sun like stars. We'll also talk about the Apollo 11 anniversary and uh, what's happening with Astronomers Without Borders. Joining me this week on my screen right now, I've got sometimes uh, guest co host, I've uh, got Mike Simmons from Astronomers Without Borders. Mike, welcome yes. back. Thank you. It's been too long. Yeah, yeah, I think it's been at least it's time, you know, our, our annual uh, checkup. Yeah. find out what's happening with astronomers without borders we've also got my uh our the the senior editor for universe today nancy atkinson nancy welcome back hey there although you're, thank you very much you're on super hiatus because you've got a book yep show yep, us the I book do. show us the book you yeah. want to do it now okay yeah, we'll just we'll, we'll just, get, we'll get into it, it again eight years to the moon so shiny the history yeah it's very shiny Eight Years to the Moon, the History of the Apollo Missions. That is awesome. And yeah, it's a lot of fun now that it's a physical thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I recall you being in a certain amount of uh, difficulty, stress, working on a book. Yeah. So I can't yeah, wait to. That happens. To, yes. I don't, I don't know what kind of maniac writes a second book. That's, that's, that's what I got to find out. Uh, we've also got uh, Dr. Morgan Renberg. Morgan. Hey, Fraser. Happy podcast day. Yeah, I'm glad somebody said it. And uh, last but not least, we've got Dr. Brian Koberlein. Brian. Hi. I'm doing pretty well. Glad, uh, hope, glad to have you back again. Wonderful to have, a, again, a, a tamed astrophysicist that we can draw upon to help answer our deep and meaningful questions about the cosmos. So thanks for joining us. Thanks. All right. Before we get into uh, this week's collection of stories, I want to uh, do two things. One piece of housekeeping, which is that this is, I believe, the penultimate episode, or is it the? That's what I've been telling myself. Penultimate. It's the penultimate episode of the weekly space hangout before we go on to our hiatus. So next week will be the last episode. Um, and then we will go on to our summer break, and then we'll be back in September. That said, we will be probably doing some various events with me, Paul, Pamela, others, when we're at the Star Party uh, starting on June 26th. So there's probably going to be some more content that will be coming your way, and we'll probably get put out into the weekly Space Hangout feed. But uh, next week is going to be the last live show that we do. So as part of that, I just want to remind you that during the long and dark summer where you'll be without weekly Space Hangout, this is your opportunity, your reminder to go to the weekly Space Hangout crew and join that community so that you can have some friends to uh, to sort of commiserate as you wait for the science and space to return in the in the fall. So go to wshcrew.space. The whole community exists for this purpose to uh, ride out the the summer hiatus together. You can do it. Yeah. So just do it. wshcrew.space. They've got a great community forums. They will give you your executive producer status with. Uh, with a weekly space hangout so that you can bring on the guests that you want to see on the show. So please do it. It's awesome. We couldn't do the show without them. And uh, so I want to make sure that they uh, get more followers. All right. So Mike Simmons, let's start with you. Uh, I don't have any specific topic, but I just want to know what's going on with Astronomers Without Borders. Well, first of all, I noticed my crummy light that I tried to get going before we started <laughs> just went out. Yeah. Uh, so be, before we get done here, I'll turn on some other lights. Uh, <clears throat> Astronomers Without Borders. Well, you know, we just celebrated the 10th uh, Global Astronomy Month. And that was a follow on to the 100 hours of astronomy that I did during the International Year of Astronomy, where we had, you know, somewhere between a half and one million people look through telescopes in a single night. And we're, we're doing a lot of other things to support people. We have a lot of big plans, too. This is going to be sort of a transition year. Um, one of the things we're doing, you know, after the big eclipse in, in North America in 2017, we told people, hey, why don't you send your glasses into us when you're done with them? We can send them on to other countries where they can use them. And we've raised money for this before. And we got like 15,000 glasses over to Africa for schools there and so on. 
Well, okay, so we didn't expect like three million or something. <laughs> I mean, it just it was just completely out of control. It was nuts. <clears throat> so uh, Explore Scientific, big plug for them, and thank you. Great supporter, great company that stored all of these in their warehouse. And uh, the Sugar Creek Astronomical Society in Northwest Arkansas, uh, who vetted them all. And we've got, uh, what have we got? A uh, total of about, uh, oh, I don't know, 100,000. Let's see, not less than that. Going down to uh, Argentina, to Chile, to Peru. Um, we've got other countries that they'll be going to. And we have angular eclipses coming up later this year and next year as well. And so in, in fact, for the, the annulars in Asia, we really need about 3 billion glasses, but we're not going to go there. <laughs> right. Um, we have other things going on there as well. We have one program running right now. It's related to um, some Apollo uh, anniversary programs that we had uh, scheduled and we've run a few. Uh, this one's lunar selfies. We just want to get people to take pictures of the moon uh, all around the world and display them with some foreground in it with yourself in it something like this a little bit like uh the day the earth smiled that we did in conjunction with uh carolyn porco and, right and right optics lab there when uh when cassini took its picture of earth and we were all in the picture we were all well half of us were in the picture anyway but you know we, yeah. we told everybody just take a picture of something it was very creative this is a great thing just to have fun and we'll be able to take those and show this is where the moon looks here or there, whatever. You know, there are a lot of things you can do with it. Show different places around the world uh, working on, you mentioned the community. Okay, this time next year, hopefully before that, we're going to have a new platform. We're going to be able to connect everybody. We'll give you a space on there. Weekly space, uh, hangout uh, followers could probably, you know, hang out there or whatever else. Uh, just a home for our global community around the world. Uh, in almost every country, and you know, as, and, and as people know about AWB, know astronomy is in every country. It's been in every culture throughout time, and there are enthusiasts every place. And you know, I've had people like somebody went to Uganda, and he said he met the only amateur astronomer in the country. The guy didn't know of any others. And I said, well, I know at least two. You know, so I mean, we connect everybody together, and. Uh, it's everywhere. So we've got big plans to, for, for that as well, as well as in being as inclusive as possible. Astronomy for the blind and visually impaired, the deaf, uh, and other things like that. Astronomy truly is for everyone. So what, much... what's the best way for people to, to get involved? I mean, it, I mean, I think one of these things with astronomy is that once you spend some time using a telescope and you really start to appreciate it, and you've looked at Saturn a bunch of times, the the urge is to now, sh you know, get your friends to take a look at, at Saturn to try and mm -hmm. share that experience with with other people. So so how can people get involved in some of the projects that you're working on? Well, that's a, one of the things that's good about this. It started <clears throat> almost politically, you know, when I, I went to Iran for a total solar eclipse and <clears throat> connected Americans. And wh when we do programs, for example, about Mars uh, a while back, about Saturn, and every, we know everybody's observing it, and we know they're sharing it with everybody because there is this, I mean, it is just too cool. Probably your audience has all looked through a telescope. If you haven't, find a telescope and look through it because you have no idea. It'll change your life. And everybody wants to share this. They've discovered the universe and their place in it, and they want everybody to, to see this. And so doing it together adds a whole other dimension to it. Our motto is one people, one sky. And... It, it, you know, it's just obvious when you see people doing the same thing, the telescope's the same, all the clothes are different, the people look different, but everybody's doing the same thing and they're looking at the same things. Yeah. So it really is, is universal. So those programs are a, a good way to take part. Uh, and it makes people in isolated communities feel more a part of something larger. Best thing you can do really is to go onto our website and sign up. Uh, it's free. We don't mind if you pick a paid membership, but it's okay if you pick a free one. Uh, follow us on Facebook uh, and Twitter. And there's a lot of stuff going on there. Well, you'll get all the announcements and anything new coming up. So what's the so what's the next big event then that people should be be watching out for? <clears throat> That's a good question. We just <laughs> talked today about how we really need to schedule a little further out. Uh, and uh, you know, we may be doing something for uh, the Apollo 
right. 11th anniversary, and we're talking about that too. Uh, I remember that you said you used to have telescopes on here and show people stuff, and I said. Fraser, let me know. I'll get, I'll get one of the telescopes at Mount Wilson. You know, we can use it. To yeah, we're still – that's probably one of the things that we're going to be uh, spending a little more time with over the over the summer is we've got um, uh, Oceanside uh, Photo and Telescope, OPT, is, yeah. is sort of setting up a whole bunch of more telescopes, and they're sort of upgrading all the software and capabilities on them. So – during mm -hmm. the hiatus, I think I'll have a lot more time to do some more of the live astronomy stuff. So that would be great. Definitely, uh, yeah, yeah. I'll let you and know. We may, we may do something from Mount Wilson. We're still talking about that. And that would be really exciting. Yeah. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of just reaching out to people and sharing with the community what everybody is doing. Again, sort of being the astronomy hub. I think that's yeah. the, the biggest thing. The eclipse down in South America has attracted a lot of interest. In the fall, we'll have some other things going on. But. All right, so your website again, astronomerswithoutborders.org. Did I get that right? That's right. Okay, That's great. It. Yeah, go there, sign up, participate. And this is the key. Like, you've got your telescope. You know the night sky. Now it's time to share your fondness of the, of the night sky with other people and help people around the world who don't have access or just don't have the capability to bring them one step closer to being able to appreciate astronomy. And you can put something in your profile, uh, post a member's report, introduce yourself to everybody what we're doing is creating something that's more interactive so you get more comments but we're there and we're watching it too so come on in and if you look at the website go through the member reports you will see reports from you know malaysia saudi arabia every place around the world yeah too. awesome all right but you, mike you're going to stick around and uh i'm sure you're going to have some insights into some of the stories we're going to be talking about so uh uh, well, I have opinions. Yeah, I don't yeah. know about insights. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Stick around. <laughs> we'll talk to you. Uh, we'll talk to you in a bit. All right. Uh, moving on. Uh, our other special guest slash co-host of Days of Your uh, Nancy Atkinson. All right. Hey there. Book again. Let's see the book. Let's see the book again. Eight years to the moon. <laughs> uh, now, uh, and how did this? What kind of maniac writes a second book first? That's my question. <laughs> Well, I, you know, you, you know me that when you asked me to do something, I could never refuse you. Oh, so, oh so this is my fault. Yeah. I said you should write a second book. I do not <laughs> no. recall that conversation. <laughs> I know you asked me about it, you know, after I wrote my first one, you said, do you think you'll write a second one? And I said, well, I don't know. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, so uh, probably getting close to two years ago, my publisher contacted me again and said, hey, our would publisher. you like to, yeah, you our publisher, same yeah. publisher that Fraser has, Page Street Publishing. And uh, they said, would you, we'd like to write another or work on another book with you. And we kind of tossed around some ideas here and there and um, just kind of in random conversations here and there. At one point I, I mentioned something about the Apollo 11 50th anniversary was coming up, not, you know, it was just something that came up in conversation. And the publishers stopped me right there and said, wait, what? <laughs> There's a 50th anniversary coming up. That's what you're writing about. Yeah. So, so the challenge, though, became trying to do something that hadn't been done before, just like the Apollo people had to do back in the 1960s was do all sorts of things that hadn't been done before. So, yeah, um, I would say Apollo is one of the most well-documented, especially Apollo 11, one of the most well-documented events in U.S. history, world history, maybe. Um, so the challenge was to do something kind of different. So um, I love to tell people stories, and I love to tell behind-the-scenes stories. So uh, the the other challenge was to try to find really behind-the-scenes people. And of course, this all happened 50 years ago. So most of the people who worked on Apollo are in their 70s or 80s or Sadly, some are no longer with us. And so I, I couldn't just call up my usual people at Johnson Space Center and say, hey, can I interview these people? And they said, so they, they didn't know, you know, they don't know the, how to get a hold of most of these people because they're all retired. So that took a little uh, um, uh, sleuthing and detective work to get a hold of people. But once I did, it, it really kind of snowballed. So I thought maybe I could interview 20 people or so that work behind the scenes and tell their stories. Well, I ended up interviewing over 40 because the way it worked is that I would, I would talk to somebody and ask them questions and 
and they'd say, well, yeah, I don't know, but that you really need to talk to Bob. And then I would talk to Bob and he'd say, oh, you need to really talk to Bill. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, so I ended up interviewing um, over 40 people, close to 45 people. And um, then also I used the oral histories of about 20 additional people. And so for a total of about 60 unique voices in the book. Wow. All telling, yeah. So, but I had to also tell the whole story of Apollo as well, because this happened 50 years ago, and not everybody is well acquainted with what all took place in, in the eight years from President Kennedy's challenge to reach the moon until 1969, when Neil and Buzz step, set foot on the moon. So... Give us like at least a couple of anecdotes that maybe people will have not heard of, people who are familiar with the Apollo missions, maybe something that you didn't know. Um, well, I talked to the guy who helped to design the flag and the flagpole that, that they put on the moon. So originally they weren't going to do anything like put a, a flag on the moon because the UN, the UN had passed a resolution saying that no country could claim any part of space. And, but Congress kind of said, we want a flag anyway. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so um, it was actually just like uh, about 10 days before Apollo 11 was going to launch. And uh, this guy has a knock on his door in his office and his boss comes in. His, this guy's name is Tom Moser. And uh, this, his boss comes in, shuts the door, sits down. He says, I'm going to ask you something, ask you to do something. And you can't tell anyone about it not even your family. You have to design a flag or at a flagpole that the astronauts can can place on the moon. And you've got to, it's got to be placed on the outside of the lunar module because right now there's no place to put it in the inside and the, ha the astronauts have to be able to access it. So there was a group of about five guys who went down to the local hardware store and bought some flags for $5.50 each and uh, figured out how they could make this whole thing work. Right, and because there is obviously no wind blowing. So how, do you, right. make, how do you make the flag uh, hang properly on the surface of the moon? And that's the thing. It didn't hang properly. So the original plan was it was going to be straight out and just be hanging you know straight but on the moon um neil and buzz couldn't get the whole thing to expand there was a little catch in it or something and so it didn't expand all the way and so it has this kind of ripply look and in honor of that happening the rest of the the flag mass for the rest of the apollo missions were also designed to be shorter so it looked like the flag was waving and 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 obviously as they you know jiggle them back and forth the the fabric is is rippling but yep and but not actually waving and little did they realize that this is what the the apollo moon hoaxers would would uh hang all of their their yeah. arguments on yep yeah that's kind of too bad but yeah yeah so so let people so for people who maybe haven't got their calendars open and have everything figured out what are the key dates that are coming up that will be the 50th anniversary well uh the apollo 11 launched on july 16th that's coming up relatively soon and uh and then they flew to the moon and and landed on it on july 20th and uh, i was a, a young girl and I remember sitting there with my family and watching this on TV and it was a Sunday night and we even got to stay up late and watch, watch the moonwalk. And it was, it was pretty amazing. Something that has really stuck with me for the rest, for my entire life. Uh, uh, probably one of the reasons why I have the job that I do. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, there are so many events all across the country and I'm sure if you check with your local, um, uh, chapter of the National Space Society or uh, your local science museum or planetarium, they're going to have some event in, uh, in conjunction with the, an the anniversary of Apollo 11. So check out your events. I know if you live in Houston or uh, in Florida near Cape Canaveral, uh, I'm sure there's 
huge, huge events going on. Well, good. And now, so now that you've got your book in hand, now comes the, the fun job of promotion. So, uh, yeah, you're going to be able to, uh, to make the rounds. You're going on tour. Well, um, I'll be doing a few events here in Minnesota. I'll be at the Convergence uh, Science Sci-Fi Convention here in Minneapolis uh, from July 4 to 7th. I'll be a speaker there. I'll also be at the Bell Museum in Minneapolis on July 17th. And I'll be speaking with one of the people that I interviewed for my book. His name is Earl Kyle. And he is one of the few, very few African-American engineers who worked on Apollo during those days. He worked for Honeywell in Minneapolis. And uh, he has a really unique and wonderful story that I feel so honored that I got to share in my book. And there, uh, throughout the book, there, there are other people like that as well. I, I talked with two of the very few um, women engineers at NASA during those, that time. Uh, so many people in very unique jobs, people who worked on the, the thrusters. Um, the one area that I really thought was fascinating was the, the simulation people, people who figured out how to uh, pretend you're in space and make it feel like it was really real and uh, gave the astronauts such, such uh, wonderful training. Oh, amazing. Yeah. All right, and Nancy, you're going to stick around as well. Did you, uh, while we talk about some of these other stories, you're, sure. you're also free to go. But if, but uh, before you do uh, move on, where can people buy a copy? Where can people find out more? The books come out on July 2nd, and they're available for pre-order any place now, like Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million. Um, ask your local bookstore if they could order it for you if you like to shop there, and I'm sure they will. And, um, Yeah. Is... Some people in the chat asking how they can get a signed copy. Uh -huh. Are you selling those anywhere? Um, I'm not right now. I don't have any signed copies, but if you contact me and if you buy a book online or however you buy it, I can send you a signed book plate. I, I'm on Amazon pre-ordering it right now. Perfect. Oh, thank you, thank you. I, I got to read this. Yeah. So you 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 know you mentioned some stories that you have that you didn't describe. I'm going to find out. <laughs> you know, I was, uh, I just got to say that I was a little older than you. I'm the old codger in this crowd. I was a young adult. I had my daughter uh, on my lap. She was, I think, three months old. And uh, she's happy that she uh, saw it because I made her look at the TV at that time. And it's such a big thing. Not quite the full experience, but it's... Yeah. Uh, I'm looking forward to reading your book because I think it'll really help people understand what it was really all about. Amazing. All right. Uh, Brian Koberline, I'm going to uh, give you the chance to go, to go next here. Uh, we've okay. got, uh, we've got an official announcement from the American Astronomical Society about how they feel about Starlink. Let me guess. Thumbs up. Uh, not so good. They're, they're, they're cautious about it. They're not, uh, specifically entirely putting it thumbs down. Um, I think because part of it is you kind of recognize this is probably inevitable at some point with these types of, of large swarms of satellites are gonna go uh, into orbit, but, but they're really strongly urging caution in trying to mitigate the effects of this because when you're talking about something like 12,000 satellites, uh, that's, that's gonna have some serious implications, not not just for truly dark skies where you're going to see these things at you know magnitude five or something like that um but but also in terms of sky surveys for example uh visible and infrared are going to be disrupted by this uh these things are going to be broadcasting at radio frequencies so radio astronomy is going to be affected by this it's it's a huge thing for astronomy um not just for internet connectivity and so they really encourage that uh, companies work with astronomers to try and find some type of balance point. Do they have any specific recommendations or is it more like we would have preferred to have been consulted? I, 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 I don't know. It wasn't we would have preferred to be consulted, although I'm sure that's true. I mean, the, the, the horse has already left the barn. I, I think it's now you really need to consult with us now before this is already laid out, uh, now is the time to actually try and discuss these things. 
with, I mean, 60 in one launch is a lot, but there are already 1,500 operational satellites, another several thousand unoperational ones. There's the International Space Station. There's another 20,000 pieces of space junk that are moving through the night sky. So this problem is something that they're aware of, but the potential for it to literally double in a year or two years is the part that I'm sure is just freaking oh. them out. The right. good news... And... Go ahead, Brian. Oh, I was going to say, and these things are going to be active. They'll burn out when they're not active. So they're actively transmitting radio frequencies, which is very different than a lot of the satellites now. And, and that's something that I haven't heard a lot about is the impact of the, of the radio frequencies. Do, do we know what that's going to do to radio astronomy? Um, is As far as I can tell, the, whatever frequencies they're operating at, transmitting towards Earth, those are basically dead to radio astronomy if they don't mitigate things. And they're basically, there isn't a mitigation in a sense because they only work if they're transmitting. And right, they the only mitigation There's going to be, there's there's gonna be some, yeah, some notch that is not, not there once these things start working. Yeah, the only mitigation would be to make radio quiet areas. So when they fly over some astronomy area, they just go dead, which kind of eliminates the point of them. Well, I mean, it, I mean, it eliminates, mostly eliminates the point, but it doesn't seem like it's impossible. Like I can imagine the, when they fly over North Korea or fly over China, that there, there could be some arrangement that they have to turn off their transmitters while they're flying over this, this region. So it doesn't seem like it's impossible. And I mean, you just need to minimize some chunk of the properties. So, it, but I mean, these are the kinds of conversations. And then of course, there are the conversations about, are there ways to mitigate the brightness of them? Could you install, could you paint the bottom of the van to black or something? This is, you know, things that people have been right. asking about. Is there Which you don't to want to do. Well, no, because they, then they'll heat up, right? Well, then they heat up in infrared and that's the other part of it. It's not just the visible aspect, but also their heat signatures. Yeah. Yeah, a, a bit of good news in this is that, you know, the first batches, the first few thousand of these satellites are going to be in very low orbits, which means they won't last very long, uh, wh which means there's opportunity here for an iterative approach to figuring out what's what works. And if they launch 100 of them thinking they've improved this situation and it turns out they're all magnitude two, well, those won't be around forever. And we've learned one thing not to do. Uh, once they start launching the the tranches of these that are going to be a thousand kilometers in altitude you know those are up there for keeps basically and and so we have to have whatever the solution is when those start getting launched is the way things will be and and so uh brian's right the time to engage is now while we're still in the early design stage for, for most of these because spacex isn't the only company who's doing this there are other companies who can engage before they've launched any satellites. And we need to solve these problems before we start launching the kinds of satellites that will be up there for five or 10 uh, years. How well typically have scientists been in convincing various forms of industry not to do a thing that they were planning to do? Think about the, the shipping lanes that are putting out all kinds of noises for um, – for undersea animals thinking about, I mean, just light pollution on its own. Like, would you guys be willing to have satellites in exchange for no light pollution from city lights? Like, like again, talking about horses that are already out of the stable, like that's the worst. Airplanes. Well, should... there, there, there have been uh, – collaborations before. I mean, Chile, for example, has government programs to reduce light pollution because astronomy is valued to them. And so there, there are collaborations that actually can work. I think one of the challenges about the SpaceX stuff with the satellites is that this is not localized. This is an international issue because these things are orbiting the entire Earth. And so it, it really kind of needs to be debated on the international stage and not just in Elon Musk's boardroom. Uh, and it's to SpaceX's benefit to make these as minimal as possible, because if the opposite is true and they're quite bright and there's some big outcry about them, the thing that they'll be effective in, in causing is a bunch of regulation. 
And yeah. these things could be regulated out of existence uh, pre pretty easily. And there's lots of instances in which the things scientists have wanted have not compelled companies, but have resulted ultimately in uh, regulations that force those companies to do it in a very specific way that ends up being harder than if they had just done the right thing from the get-go. Yeah, if they're like an eyesore, like every time you walk outside and there is this constant reminder of this ruination of the night sky, you would hope that, that would be able to put some pressure onto onto them to to deal with it. But but again, back to horses and stables. Uh, just wait till we get our giant O'Neill cylinders floating above our our Starfleet, uh, you know, spaceship construction yards. These are going to be bright, like. Yeah. Like the, you know, that, that golden space exploration future that we're all hoping for is going to be, is going to ruin the night sky. So you, you, you think about the views of the original Star Treks with their big, bright white um, space stations and you realize how horrific that would actually be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. With all of those starships flitting about and docking in space. Yeah, it would be, it'd be a disaster. Yeah. Yep. All right, Morgan, what do you got? Well, it's the moon is not just a thing of the past, believe it or not. It is still there. We are still studying it. And we got some pretty cool new results back, uh, really just today, actually, uh, about uh, the largest known impact crater in the solar system, which uh, is the South Pole Aitken Basin on the moon. And you can't really see uh, South Pole Aitken from Earth because it's pretty much on the far side of the moon, but it's like, ginormous. It's like, you know, 1,500 kilometers across. Um, and we kind of want to know, you know, what caused it? When did it happen? What was the effect on, on the moon? Uh, and we got a really tantalizing piece of evidence uh, from the, the GRAIL mission uh, about this. And so and Gra GRAIL is of this pair of satellites that orbit the moon. And they orbit really close to one another, within visual distance, basically, of one another. And they shoot a laser between the two of them. And if the first satellite, the one that's ahead, passes over a piece of the moon that's denser, it feels a little bit more gravity. And that gravity pulls it a little faster. And the satellites spread out. And if there's a little less material there, a little less gravity, the first one slows down, the second one catches up, they get a little closer. And so the laser uh, measures the distance between these spacecraft to like absurd precision. And then they do this, you know, gajillions of times around the moon, and they use that data to build up an internal model of what the, the moon looks like on the inside. Uh, we actually have a pair of these satellites around uh, Earth called GRACE. Uh, as well. And they can be used to measure things like the amount of water in aquifers under California, like really, really precise measurements. And, and what Grail revealed was that basically smack in the middle of the South Pole Aitken Basin, but a few hundred kilometers <laughs> under the surface is this really dense spot of stuff. Uh, and it's pretty big. It's about five times the size of the big island of Hawaii. And it's you know, like these, like everything with these gravity measurements is it could be a few different things. It could be like one really big thing, or it could be a large area that's a little bit denser. Uh, but their kind of best guess is that this is like a big chunk of metal. Uh, and that metal very likely came from the asteroid that hit the moon and caused the South Pole Aiken Basin. So this is like the core of of an asteroid. And this asteroid is big enough, that this would be like a, a planetesimal or a protoplanet, a really big guy hits in uh, to the um, the moon, creates this big uh, crater, and the, the core doesn't get destroyed. It sinks inside. But even from discovering this, we can start to find really cool things. Like had the moon been pretty molten when this happened, that core would have sunk all the way into the moon's core. And so the fact that it's not, it's suspended kind of in the middle between the core and the surface, helps put constraints on what the temperature, the consistency of the moon's crust must have been like when this happened. And that tells us more about when the date uh, of this impact might have been. That's really cool. Uh, monolith? Big, big monolith. A big, uh, big monolith. Yeah. So we'll probably never be able to study this directly because it's really, really far under 
the moon. But uh, Chinese uh, Chang'e 4 lander is in the area of South Pole Aiken Basin and is looking to make surface observations to understand the, the rocks and the composition of of that area. Uh, because it's on the far side, it wasn't one of the places the Apollo astronauts went and brought back moon rocks. And so if we add what the sort of chemical composition of these rocks are with the mass of this metal hunk, with the depth that it's sunk, we can start to figure out the geophysics of how this collision uh, might have occurred and, and figure out what the heck was going on. So lumps and bumps in the moon have been known for a long time. In fact, the, the Apollo astronauts, they had to kind of uh, change the orbits, uh, especially Apollo 8, as because these items that they are these things uh, in the moon, they call them mass cons. So um, was there anything in the paper about um, like, do, th do they think that these mass cons could be parts of asteroids, you know, and this would be this is like all over the moon. Yeah, there's everybody, the Earth included, Mars, has inconsistencies in its surface density. And the, the moon, you're right, has sort of a big, a big chunk of them. Uh, but this, this study was sort of considering this particular one uh, in, in particular. And they talked a little bit about other, you know, it wouldn't necessarily be the core of the impactor that caused South Pole Aitken Basin. Another idea was that it was a piece left over from the impact on the Earth that formed the moon in the first place. Uh, and that big collision threw up all this material that then didn't accrete exactly evenly, which is how we end up with a lot of these inconsistencies in, in the moon. And this could be the biggest of the inconsistencies, but it's awfully suspicious that it's right smacked under the center of this giant impact crater. Yeah. All right. So uh, I'm everyone's going to need their tissues at the ready here. Um, but I just wanted to remind you that on uh, June 10th, 2018, we received the last signal from NASA's Opportunity Rover. So I'm going to show you the picture that it sent. Um, and what it is, I'll share this with my uh, co-host here. So what it is, is you're looking at uh, a picture that it took from one of its nav cameras as, as the dust storm was darkening the skies and making it impossible for it to see anything. And at, you can see there's this big dark area down at the bottom, and this is where it ran out of power. So it was trying to send this final image, and it... The, uh, the solar power and the battery power on board got so low that it was no longer able to run its transmitters. And so this is the final piece of data. And June 10th was the last day that it was able to actually send a transmission, which is, you know, kind of heartbreaking. Um, but... Uh, and so now we didn't know this at the time that Opportunity was dead. We knew that, that there was this gigantic dust storm that, was, that had grown to this global scale. It was the worst dust storm, global st storm that had ever been seen uh, blanketing the atmosphere of Mars. And, and NASA knew that it was going to be a really rough ride for Opportunity because it needs to keep its, uh, its battery, its, you know, its electronics warm. And if the electronics get too cold, and it's unable to keep them warm enough, then the whole, the whole system essentially dies. Now, onboard Opportunity, they have these little pellets of, um, of decaying plutonium, sort of like the RTGs, the nuclear batteries they have on Voyagers and, and New Horizons, any of these spacecraft. And their only job is to keep them warm with the decaying uh, material in these chunks of plutonium. And then they also had heaters on with its with its battery system. And so every day opportunity would fill up its batteries with the solar panels. And then every night it would use these, these little chunks of plutonium and the heaters on board to keep its electronics above the freezing point. But as opportunity got older, the amount of battery capacity it could hold went down and down. Although even at the end, it still had like 80% of its battery capacity. It was still a pretty amazing after 5,111 days Wish on my phone worked like yeah, that. I know on the surface of ours. Yeah, mine mine definitely did not that last that long. Um, and so as the storm came in and obscured 
uh, opportunity and made the skies dark. It was unable to replenish its battery, and it went offline. But NASA continued to try to make contact with Opportunity all the way through the rest of the year, even when the dust storm had abated, all the way into pretty much to the end of the year. And finally, sort of the end of 2018 into 2019, NASA finally announced that they had given up attempting to reach Opportunity, that the spacecraft was dead forever. And so here we are, it's crazy to think exactly one year, two days after one year from when we last heard from, from Opportunity. But still, 5,111 days on the surface of Mars when it was supposed to only go for 90 days. It's a tremendous accomplishment, just demonstrates that, that these spacecraft are built tough. And, uh, and it's one of the greatest stories in space exploration. So. Thanks, Opportunity. Brian Koberlein, what else have you got for us? So the other story I've got is about the uh, Gemini planetary. Gemini, Gemini, I just lost my um, Jupiter-sized planets. Gemini planetary imager. That's what I just blanked on. <laughs> so in the Gemini, Gemini Observatory, and this is uh, looking for exoplanets by directly observing them. So it's different than the usual way, which is where the planets pass in front of the star and it dims or you see the wobble. Um, so this is directly imaging the largest of the planets that would be orbiting a star. And it's done these surveys of about 300 stars. And what it found was that Jupiter-sized planets are comparably rare for sunlight stars. They typically be they, they're typically seen around larger stars, um, and not ones that are more like the size of our sun. The reason this is important is because since it's directly imaging planets, everything looking for exoplanets has a certain bias. It's easier to find larger planets around small stars, for example, if you're looking at the Wobble. Uh, but in this case, because you have to block out the light of the sun, it's actually easier to find Jupiter-sized planets orbiting something like the sun than it is a larger, brighter star. And so the fact that they found more of these large planets around large stars than smaller ones means that there really is um, less large planets around a sun-like star. Um, and that says two things that are interesting. One is that it again confirms that our solar system is very strange. We think of our solar system as being kind of typical and it's not. Um, we have large planets and they're fairly far out, which is rather uncommon. But the other thing that this does is it confirms that planets, even large planets, are, are formed bottom up. So stars are formed top down, which means you start in a stellar nursery, you have this large cloud that collapses on itself to form a star. It makes sense that, that little planets, Earth-like planets, can form bottom up from the debris that's orbiting the star. But large planets like Jupiter, uh, brown dwarf type stars, uh, type planets, are, are, you could argue that they probably could form top down in the way that stars do. This goes against that. This says no, even really large planets seem to form bottom up, which means that the reason they're more around large stars is because there's more debris around those large stars. They form from, from larger planetary disks. And so that's really kind of a surprising finding for even the largest planets that they still do form bottom up. So then How what, oh, go ahead, Morgan. How far out can the Gemini planet imager uh, detect planets? Could it possibly be that large planets form preferentially farther out among st smaller stars and closer in among larger stars? Uh, this actually wouldn't matter because the imaging you're seeing basically out to you know Uranus or Neptune pretty easily. Uh, you have to block the star itself, and then you see whatever is around it. So even if they're farther out, um, you would still see them because in infrared they would be glowing, and this is they look both invisible and infrared. Uh, so then, you know, if we're now starting to learn that that our solar system isn't normal, what would a normal solar system look like? 
Well, like that's a, kind of a good question. We're, we're still trying to figure that out. Um, we know that there's, there's a lot more diversity in terms of stellar systems than we had originally thought. Um, you know, the problem that we're still standing on is that we, we, while we still have lots of planets that we've seen, all these different methods have different biases. So we're kind of learning this piece by piece. We don't know what a typical star system is. The only thing we know for sure is that star systems, planets are gonna be much more common around red dwarf like stars than they would be larger stars. And that's because about 75% of stars are red dwarfs. They're, they're much smaller. Um, and so that's where most of the planets are going to be. Right. But I'm just kind of imagining, you know, you talked about this idea of like bottom up, top down. So you've got like a, you've got like a larger star than the sun and it's going to have large planets around it and then smaller planets. Like, like, um, is it like a pyramid or, or is it, you know, here we've got the sun and then we've got the smaller terrestrial planets close into the sun. And then you've got these larger gas and ice giants farther out. I don't know what I mean, the a, basic a physics arguments about why you have rocky and uh, gaseous planets would still suggest that you'd expect rockier planets closer to their stars because that's where the temperature environment blows away the gas. And you'd expect gas planets further out where it's cool enough for those planets to accrete the necessary gas. Now, obviously, we see with things like hot Jupiters that that's not an exclusive arrangement, but it seems to me it'd still be very likely that you'd expect your your smallest planets to be cl closest in or most farthest away. Yeah, yeah, it's but I it, it's I love how you know we started out really assuming that all of the star systems out there are going to look similar to the solar system, and now as we do go about it, and we do find like even just the discovery of hot Jupiters no one ever planned for a planet that has multiple times the mass of Jupiter that orbits within a matter of days around its parent star within the orbit of Mercury. Super weird. And yet these things are, are out there. And so it's, it's fascinating to see. And I guess more data is necessary for us to be able to get to the bottom of this, of this question. Very cool. All right. So uh, I got one last story here that I wanted to share with people. And this is kind of cool. And this is sort of a little on on topic with what uh, you were talking about, Nancy, which is that um, uh, a team of astronomers from the United Kingdom have found the Snoopy lunar lander out in space. So for people who don't know what Snoopy is, it was actually the lunar lander that was on the Apollo 10 mission. So Apollo 11 was the first mission to actually land on the surface of the moon, obviously. But Apollo 10, Apollo 10's job was to almost land on the moon. So they flew very close to the moon, went through all the same procedures, detached their lunar lander, and threw it away out into space. And so it then was on a an orbit around the sun like the rest of the solar system. And so astronomers have been searching and searching and searching for it. And they're pretty sure that they actually have found it. Of course, it's nothing more than just a dot moving through, through space. Um, and so they had a huge chunk of space to, to look at because it's slowly drifting away from the from the from the Earth. And so. Um, it's kind of amazing that they found it. Of course, the, the next step now is to go get it, right? Um, and so something that I was looking into was really interesting. Uh, Jeff Bezos, of course, uh, founder of the Blue Origins uh, rocket company, is a huge fan of retrieving space artifacts. He uh, and his team retrieved a Saturn V rocket just a couple of years ago that had gone into the ocean after one of its launches and had... Uh, you know, gone down, retrieved it, brought it back up, restored it, and it's in it's in a museum now. And I think they went after the Liberty Bell as well, which was the one that um, Gus, Grissom Gus Grissom had to abandon ship from um, during his mission. So, um, so I think Jeff Bezos is just the man for the job to chase it down with one of his rockets, grab it, and bring it home and put it in a museum. That'll show Elon Musk. I so want them to do that. It's uh, such a stupid and pointless thing to do, but I, I so badly want it. Uh, and we should say that they didn't uh, smash the rest of the lunar landers into the 
uh, Moon Circus out of spite or, or anything, uh, but they were there uh, to create seismic uh, impacts that could be picked up by the seismometers left by the Apollo missions on the surface to actually to do science. Right. Uh, and so it wouldn't have made sense to smash one in before there was anything on the surface to Detect measure it. Smash. Um, but the other ones were very useful uh, of, for measuring those sorts of things. I think they even whacked the moon with one of the upper stages of the Saturn V mm -hmm. on one of the, the missions okay. to give an even bigger boom uh, that could be picked up by those things. I think Jeff Bezos should retrieve Elon Musk's Tesla Rhodes. Oh, That's snap. Like who owns That's a power move right there. Yeah, that really oh, is. Assert dominance. <laughs> hey, hey, Elon, I found your car. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's funny. Zephan Zephan said the exact same thing in the in the uh, in the comments. That is so great. All right, we are reaching the the end of our hour. Of uh, Mike, where can people find out more and get involved? Astronomerswithoutborders.org. And uh, while you're there, go check out the member reports and see astronomy around the world. Sign up, get the news, take part. Right on, Nancy. NancyAtkinson.com, and uh, I'll be releasing a uh, unique video trailer about the book within the next week. So watch for that. And we'll see the book one more time. All right. So Eight shiny. Years to the Moon. Shiny, iridescent, really yeah. stands out. It's going to be, it's, it is a unique book. I'll say that. That's amazing. Um, Morgan, where can people find out more? What are you working on? Yeah, well, if you're in the West and you're not near Houston, uh, you should definitely come by uh, the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History because I wager we have one of the best opportunities to see some cool Apollo stuff out there. We have not only an amazing exhibit with things that went to the moon, we have the amazing, incredible IMAX documentary uh, assembled from newly scanned footage of the uh, Apollo 11 mission. And in July, we'll have a planetarium show all about uh, the moon as well. So come by, check that stuff out, say hi. We'll have a, all sorts of events happening on the 20th to commemorate uh, 50 years from a pretty cool thing. Yeah, you guys are going all in on this whole moon. Oh, we are we're all about it. And, yeah. Uh, you should come check it out. That sounds great. All right, Brian Koberline, where do people, what are you working on? Um, well, I'm working on this TV thing that's coming, but uh, the other thing is in three weeks, I'll be in Chile for the uh, summer eclipse. Oh, you're so, going to the eclipse in Chile. I'm, I'm going to be at the eclipse in Chile, believe it or not. Paul's going to uh, be there too. Who is? Uh, Paul Sutter. Is he oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. He's got his trip. Okay. So, I didn't so, know he was doing this one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, of course, their our summer is their winter, so it's okay. their winter. Yes, yeah. so I have to scrounge up all the winter clothes because yeah. it, I'll also be at one of the observatories, so I'll be at elevation. Oh, so it's going to be even colder. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, you can follow me on BrianCoverline.com. I'll post updates when I have internet. You know, Musk's thing isn't up yet, so I'll have to piecemeal it. But uh, you can follow me as I go to see the eclipse. That's incredible. Uh, all right, I'm going to shift us back into the gallery view here. So we're all there. Uh, there's all of us. So uh, here we are again, the penultimate episode of the Weekly Space Hangout. Thanks, everyone, for watching us. Thanks for all of my co-hosts and these blasts from the past joining us. To uh, it's, I'm feeling so nostalgic today. Can you tell? Um, but, yeah, so thanks, everyone, watching. Thanks to our moderators. Thanks to everyone bringing all of these stories. Uh, we will see you all next week for the ultimate episode of the Weekly Space Hangout before we go on to our hiatus. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.